Good morning. Good morning. Great to see you. We want to welcome back folks from the hinterland of Arizona. Good to have you guys back. Good to see you. We, uh, we persevered here in Idaho while you were down in the land of sun and not so much sun and wind and we had gorgeous gorgeous winter up here in the ah. 70s most of the time <laughs> uh oh I'll have to repent so, so it is great to see you we want to begin our worship this morning with the ringing of the church bell Good morning. Good morning. Um, before we start the announcements, I just want to read a scripture that's in your blanket fund um, information, and it is, and don't forget to do good and share with those in need. Hebrews thirteen sixteen. And on to announcements. There are several in your bulletin. I won't go over all of them. I'll go over the most urgent ones. And um, A AED training is coming up this Tuesday at May the 2nd at 6.30 here. And if you want to be trained in this in case someone has a heart attack, <clears throat> it's just the church being prepared and that's a great way to serve and it's not difficult. You can just show up at 6.30, uh, no need to pre-register, but if you have questions, you can call my husband and his number's in the bulletin. And um, the Women's Fellowship is serving the community yet again by donating items to the St. Luke's Elmore Long-Term Care Unit, and also in your bulletin is a list of those items that they're interested in, and there's a information on the back, in the back on the table. Uh, Blanket Sunday is coming up, Mother's Day, and you'll see that Jennifer has the blankets out to inspire us and remin remind us to serve the others through that offering. And then there is a National Day of Prayer. Last week I said the wrong day. But it is May 4th, which is this Thursday, at the courthouse at noon. So if you would want to serve the community by praying either publicly or, or in your own home, um, Thursday is a good day to send those prayers upward. Any other announcements? Good morning. Well, what a busy week and weekend we had. Some of us were here Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and some didn't make it this morning. But I'm here to tell you that our treasurer says after um, our net after paying sales tax was $1,746. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And that, we had wonderful help. Um, men, women, there was never a time when we didn't have someone we could call on to do something. Um, and I'm not going to name names, but they, they will appear somewhere. So thank you again for all your help with the rummage sale. As you notice, there's still some boxed, lots of boxes up there. The ARC will pick them up Friday. So thanks again. Any other announcements? Just a reminder for those involved with the church finances. I'm sorry, but I have to use the A word. We're having our audit today after church. So if you're involved with the finances, grab your coffee or some juice, get some refreshments, and yeah, you guys have some sandwiches for you. So we're good. 
Any other fun stuff going on? Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, so let's go to the call of, of worship. And it comes from Deuteronomy and Psalms 18. And now, what does the Lord our God ask of us but to fear the Lord? Let us walk in obedience to him and love him. Let us serve the Lord our God with all of our hearts and all of our souls. We will praise him from our whole hearts and declare his marvelous works. The Lord is our rock and our deliverer, our strength in whom we trust. Therefore, we'll give thanks and sing his praises. And hymn 497, the choir will sing the first verse and then we'll join on the second and third verses.
How beautiful. Now if you would join me in the invocation. Ours is the sunlight. Ours is the morning. What a glorious promise, O oh God, and what a wonderful hope. We praise you for the great truths of our faith that sustain us, even in the darkest or most trying moments of our lives. Through our worship today, forgive us for the times when we have not been aware of your presence, when we not pause to thank you for life itself. So let the sparks of hope in the ashes of our sin and failures be fanned into flames again and our spirits warmed and encouraged by the power of your loving and forgiving spirit, resurrecting us to new and living purpose. In your name and power, amen. Now if you could pass the peace and sign the register. Okay, I don't see any children here this morning, so we'll go ahead and and share our joys and concerns with one another. Unless Curtis, you wanted me to do the children's message for you. Oh, no. oh okay, okay, <laughs> okay. Gracious Father, you've chosen and cherished and called us to be your followers. Help us to realize more and more that we're blessed in order to be a blessing. And so may we be used by you to fill the blessing-shaped void inside of folks needing to be uplifted by our words, our actions of love, our encouragement throughout this week, this week to come. Lord Jesus, you call us to real life, real life and relationship, and you give us purpose and meaning. There's grace for our failures and steps toward new beginnings, always calling us to a closer relationship with you. And so help us to care for and love others in your name and to keep our eyes on you, you who call each of us to be and to serve and how to serve you in our own unique ways and purpose. We do lift up those in need of prayer this day, the things that have been shared out loud, the things that we know of that you're aware of as well beyond that. We thank you that your grace is amazing and wonderful and that we can rejoice and be glad in it. We thank you for this time of prayer, even as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Um, due to a few circumstances, this is the last Sunday the choir is going to be singing this until next fall. I hope maybe there's some people out there that maybe will join us in the fall. We would love to have some more voices. 
Uh, the song that we're singing today is one that Connie brought us. It's a praise song, and we hope you enjoy it. And I want to thank all of these wonderful ladies up here who have worked so hard and put up with me uh, for a number of months. So um, this is what? What's the name? Anyway, whatever it is, I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> Really, thank you. Thank you all for your ministry, your service, music. We appreciate y'all. Yeah, we really do. We give our tithes and offerings this morning. As we do that, let's be praying that what we give will be used by the Lord, possibly in unusual acts of love, even through the most usual of circumstances. We now are giving as uh, symbols of our love and our faithfulness, our obedience, following the Lord. We now receive our morning offering. Lord Jesus, we dedicate these gifts and with the prayer that we'll bless all the people that we can in every way we can with all the love that we can. We pray it in your generous name. Amen.
Our scripture lesson today comes from John 21, verses 1 through 19. Jesus appears to the seven disciples. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Canaan of Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. And they said to him, We will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, Children, have you no fish? And they answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net to the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple, whom Jesus loved, said to Peter, It is the Lord! When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and he jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from land, only about a hundred yards. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, a hundred and fifty-three of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. And Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to them, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. And a third time he said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he'd said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and go wherever you wished. But when you grew old, <clears throat> when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, follow me. The word of God for the people of God. Over the last few weeks leading up to Easter, we spent time with Jesus as he traveled what we called the path of the passion that was listening to his words from the cross. During Holy Week, we marveled again at Jesus' death 
on Good Friday. We talked about the torn veil on that Good Friday evening worship. Last Sunday, and now today, we focus on the reality and the power and the purpose shown to us in the resurrection. Now, the verses from the Gospel of John this morning are set not at the empty tomb or, as last week, the road to Emmaus. The backdrop this morning is that morning-lit Sea of Galilee, sometimes called the Sea of Tiberias, the same thing, the Sea of Galilee, rocky beach, and a glowing charcoal fire. Peter had said, I'm going out to fish. And six of the other disciples said, well, we'll just go along with you. And the whole account seems like a kind of a, a step backward in their lives. They've gone back to what was familiar. Last week we talked about the Christ of the Emmaus Road and those two disciples, Cleopas and the other disciple, likely his wife. And they're saying, let's go home, back to Emmaus, let's go home. Today, the disciples are, seems, they seem to be saying, let's go back. So they go out fishing. They're out there all night. They catch not a thing. And it's kind of a symbol of their lives at this point. Lacking some real purpose or kind of in, empty, wondering what to do, where they're headed. Lacking what? Motivation? hope. Well, Jesus meets them at the, that, at the end of that long night of, of fishing, and he shares with them three specific commands. There are three that we read here. And they, they form the basis of a rediscovery of purpose that this chapter highlights, and it's really good word for us as well. First command is cast your nets. Cast your nets on the other side. It's verses 3, 3 through 6 there. Just hear them again. The disciples went out, got into the boat. That night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore. The disciples didn't realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. And you can hear that. No. He said, well, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. They've gone back to the familiar, back to the secure. They've gone back to the routine. Uh, a sigh. Maybe if I just go back. The disciples were frustrated and when we keep trying to go backward instead of looking ahead in the Lord's leading, his plan, we can just kind of like them sink deeper and deeper into a kind of rut. A rut is frustrating because you can only go the way the rut takes you. A rut takes no thinking, not much effort, and there's also very little purpose or joy in a rut. And somebody, in fact, has said that a rut is a grave with the ends knocked out. pretty descriptive there, isn't it? Now, do we ever use daily routine to insulate ourselves against the new things that the Lord might want to be doing in our lives? Do we ever use daily routine or the way it's always been to insulate ourselves against the new things that the Lord might be wanting to do in our lives now? The feeling here in our scripture is that Peter was attempting to, to hide in a kind of familiar pattern from the mistakes that he'd made lately. His moral defeat, his denial of Jesus, as well as the events that he didn't understand. And so he and Thomas and Nathaniel and James and John, the sons of Zebedee, and two others that aren't named, return to what they know about. They may not be great men of faith, but they do know about fishing. And just as they've stuck with Thomas through all of his agony and his doubt, well, I won't believe until I see the nail prints. 
They've stuck with Thomas through his agony, through his doubt. Now they're standing with Peter as he struggles with failure. The sun begins to rise. person on the shore calls out, Caught anything? And like most fishermen, (laughs) they didn't want to admit that they'd come up empty-handed. And so they reluctantly admit, No. There's just, that's the word. In John's Gospel, the translation of the Greek, no. That's it. Don't ask us again. No. Well, throw your net out on the other side, on the right side of the, the, the right side, the other side of the boat. That doesn't mean the wrong right, wrong left, that thing, that there was the, the wrong or right side. It's just put it out on the right side of the boat as opposed to the left side. Okay. Now Jesus could see what they couldn't. They go from an erosion of purpose, an erosion of purpose, catching nothing, to an explosion of purpose when they realize it's the Lord. It's the Lord. Now suddenly they remembered the time early on when the same thing had happened and when Jesus had asked and done the same thing. So now, think about what Peter does here. He's got a net load full of fish, but he throws on his outer garment and he leaves all those fish behind. Why? Why? Well, because he's got a greater purpose than just fish now. And he puts on an outer garment. Why? Well, because to Jews, a greeting is a religious act, and to carry out a religious act one must be clothed. And because he's greeting the Lord, this is a spiritual and holy action. Now, we just pause here. Pause here and see what Jesus teaches us about God's purpose for our lives. What does God teach us here? What are the lessons? We can ask, every one of us can ask this. What's the lesson here for my life? What's Jesus seeking to teach me for my life here? Well, the first thing that we see here is that failure and discouragement do not mean that I've lost my purpose. We can fail, we can get discouraged, but it doesn't mean that we've lost our purpose. Now, it can feel that way. Never forget the faithful men and women of the Bible who didn't have everything go as their desires had dictated. The fact is, our lives aren't always easy. And life is not a quick sprint. It's more like a marathon. And we can have faith that there's a plan and purpose for everything that we face and have to deal with this side of heaven. So failure and discouragement don't mean that I've lost my purpose. Now the second thing in here is that the secret, the secret to success is not necessarily trying harder. <laughs> secret to success is not necessarily trying harder. The disciples cast the net over and over on the same side. And Jesus comes along and says, why don't you try another way? What would steps toward a new beginning look like? It's a good question. What would steps toward a new beginning look like for us as individuals and for us as a congregation? What would steps toward a new beginning look like? look like for us. Another lesson here is the problem may not be where I am, but what I'm listening to. And another lesson is I'm never far from success when I permit Jesus to give the orders. Sometimes the difference between failure and success is the width of the boat. Okay? Now, Now we come to the verses about the charcoal fire. So interesting. The only time in scripture that the term for this type of fire is used is in John's gospel, when he describes the fire where Peter was warming warming himself the night of his threefold denial of Jesus. Listen to verse 18 of John 18. John 18, 18. It was cold, The servants and officials stood around a fire they'd made to keep warm, and Peter was also standing with them, warming himself. 
Now, Peter's standing in the courtyard. He's warming himself while Jesus is being falsely accused inside. And it's by this fire that Peter denied his Lord repeatedly. Jesus now seems to deliberately set the stage for Peter to deal with his failure and his defeat. Verse 9, chapter 21. Hear it again. When they landed, they saw a fire burning, a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. This fallen disciple and his loving Lord and they're by a fire, a charcoal fire again. The only two times this kind of reference is made to that kind of fire. Now, you just have to wonder, is Peter still remembering the painful and guilt-producing failure? So far, no number of tears have been able to wash the image from his mind. Could he ever be what he once had been? Had he disqualified himself from service? I'll just go fishing. Would his heart ever know peace? No, I'll just go fishing. He needed help. He needed healing. We all do at times. And we, along with Peter, are taken to the very ground of our faith where we assess where we really are so that we can get our lives straight again. Now what we see here is that a relationship with Jesus makes a difference in the normal day-to-day -day things of my life. A relationship with Jesus Christ makes a different difference in the normal day-to-day -day things of my life. It's just meant to be real. The relationship is meant to be real. So let's just think about that little word, real. R-E-A-L. R. If my relationship with Christ is meant to be real, R. Recognize the Lord's presence everywhere. Just recognize his presence everywhere during my day. Jesus, Jesus showed up where the disciples weren't expecting him. And he helped them to deal with the deepest part of hurt and hope. So we expect him to show up. E, enjoy his company. Enjoy his company. There's fish, there's bread, there's a fire, there's a beach. What do we call that? We call that a picnic. <laughs> okay? Okay? No matter what, Jesus still wanted to be with them. There was this deep, compassionate, unending love toward them. Real, R, recognize his presence. E, enjoy his company. A, accept his invitations. Accept his invitations. We can do all kinds of things with invitations. Okay? We can ignore them. We can forget them. We can accept them. But here's one not to miss. Anytime I have a desire to worship, that's an invitation. When I thought to pray about, uh, thought to pray about some situation, that's an invitation. Anytime some person crosses my mind and I think, you know, I, I need to, or I want to, or I could contact, or I could write, that's an invitation. L, look to his leadership. Look to his leadership. So, recognize his presence everywhere. Okay? Enjoy his company. Accept his invitations. And look to his leadership. These are at least four things that make for a healthy, loving, real relationship with our Lord. Now, what does he say next? He says, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Peter's heart must have skipped a beat when he heard Jesus' words recorded there in the first, first part of verse 15. The first questions. Listen again, verses 15 to 17. They finished eating. Jesus turns to Simon Peter. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord. You know I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you, you know I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. 
Then the third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him that the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you, you know all things. You know I love you. And then Jesus said, feed my, feed my sheep. You love me. Now, isn't it amazing? Isn't it absolutely amazing that for a threefold denial, back there the night of Jesus' betrayal, that mock trial that he went through, for Peter's threefold denial, now there's a threefold opportunity, a threefold question. But that's how the Lord deals with us. He reaches down to the level of our hurt within us, and time and time again, he gives us the opportunity to begin again, to reaffirm our love for him as the basis of the healing of the memories of my sin, my failure, my goofs and foul-ups, my denials. For as many times as you and I have denied him, even this past week, here in worship this morning, Jesus is asking us the same kind of question. Do you love me? Do you love me? And it goes right to the heart of it. Right to the heart of it. Your heart and mine. So the questions are, how do, how do you, how do you deny the Lord? How do I turn on my heels and say, I, I don't know him. I never knew him. How do you do it? With the people in your family, when you turn off love, when that's precisely what's needed? Does it happen when you take a a fragile personality and you kind of squeeze it into a mold of criticism? When you tear another person apart in hostile judgment? How do we deny him? subtle evasion of truth a word slipped in or a word left out or is it when we have the opportunities to say yeah I'm a follower of Jesus yes I belong to Christ I'm one of his followers but we're silent how do we deny him when we do little to change our part of the world do we deny him in the way we spend our time Do we deny him in the way we spend our money? Do we deny him in the way we talk? The habits that we pamper into power? Every one of us, every one of us has his or her own way. And Jesus simply asks me, he asks you, do you love me? He has a way of introducing a person to him or herself, of just clarifying the issues in such a way that we can see the, what our basic and ultimate loyalties are. And that's what he did for Peter, whom at this point, he does not call him Peter. He calls him Simon, an acknowledgement of the old life that Peter seems to have returned to. He called him by that name, Simon, not Peter, not Peter the rock. It's deliberate. It's motivated by love, but it's calculated to hurt, and it did hurt. John tells us it hurt Peter. Can you truly say you love me? Now, Simon is only able to respond, yes, Lord, I'm your friend. We really don't understand this passage until we look into the Greek of it, the original language here, and see the two very different words for love that are used here. Our English translation doesn't doesn't get at it. Two Greek words that are used here. One is agape and the other is philo. Jesus used the word for ultimate loyalty, total commitment, unreserved response. Agape, and it's always used in relationship to God. Simon, in his responses, uses the word for friendship, affection. After all his failure, all of his disgrace, all the presumption, all the pride is gone, and Simon simply cannot profess a full-blown commitment 
can't do it. And so the third time Jesus asked the question, what does he do? He makes a magnificent descent down to the level of Simon's need, and he simply asked, are you really my friend? The third time Jesus asked the question, he uses the word phileo. He does the same with us. He descends right down to where we are, wherever we are, wherever we're ready, that's where he begins. Where is he motivating you to become the person that he sees you actually becoming? Beginning relationship with him? Maybe that's it. More faithfulness? New commitment to the body of Christ? Added depth to your stewardship? Turning from some old habit a particular behavior? Letting go of some bitterness? Letting go of some jealousy? Being free of that anger that just has kind of burnt its way down into your soul? Where's the risen Lord waiting to resurrect you to a new and living purpose, becoming new person? Now, if all of this sounds overwhelming, think of it this way. Just begin this way. I give as much of myself as I can to as much of God as I understand at this point of my life. Hear it again. I give as much of myself as I can to as much of God as I understand at this point in my life. And the joy of this is that he'll take you where you are and as you are, but he won't leave you there. So Jesus asked Simon Peter, do you love me more than these? Now, it's an open-ended question. It's, it, it's a hard question to, for us to answer because we don't know exactly what he meant. Do you love me more than these other men? Or more than the boats and the nets and the fishing? Or more than, as you claimed, more than these other disciples love me? It's good, really, that it's an open-ended question because we, we see its application all the more for all the secondary things we may have put in the wrong place when we begin to major on minor matters, relegating Jesus to some inferior position in our scale of values and priorities. And in saying, feed my sheep, Jesus is just pointing out an entirely new set of priorities. Take your eyes off what others are doing or not, how they're succeeding or how they're failing. Don't compare yourself with them. Just care for them. Care for them. So what does all this mean? Believe that Jesus wants to use you in a great way. That's what he's saying to Peter. It's really what he's implying to the rest of the disciples gathered there on the shore. And that's what he's saying to us today. Believe that Jesus wants to use you in a great way. The Lord has put you on earth to make a difference in somebody else's life. You say, well, I'm old. That doesn't, that doesn't count for me anymore. No, it's not true. It's not true. Okay? The Lord has put you on this earth to make a difference in somebody else's life. It may be somebody you don't even know about. You may be an example to somebody you don't even know, and yet they're watching they're watching you, and they listen to what you have to say. And then there's Jesus' last command here. He just simply says, follow me. Verses 18 and 19. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself, you went where you wanted. When you're old, you'll stretch out your hands. Somebody else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he said to him, follow me. Now, most scholars agree that this is a prophecy of Peter's death by crucifixion. And tradition tells us that Peter was crucified, but his request that it was that he be crucified upside down because he didn't, didn't believe that he was worthy to die the same way that Jesus did. And so he asked to be crucified upside down. Jesus simply just wanted Peter to know that serving him was going to be difficult. And Peter followed, and he followed knowing the cost. So the key for us is that no matter what lies ahead, the command is the same from Jesus. 
follow me. Follow me. When we're following him, our eyes are on him, not ourselves, not on somebody else, because he becomes the standard, not our own particular and imperfect form of it, not big or little followers, not great or insignificant followers, not strong or weak, ourselves as wonderful and somebody else, uh, sorry about you, not so much, or ourselves as weak and somebody else exalted and great. None of that. None of that. Somebody else important in the kingdom? Me? Not so much. None of that. We follow him. Our eyes are on him. Our hearts are devoted to him. Never discounting who we are, what we do for the sake of the master. There was a Sunday school teacher. His name was Mr. Kimball. True story. In 1858, he led a Boston shoe clerk to give his life to Christ. The clerk was Dwight Moody. He became an evangelist, and in England, in 1879, he awakened the zeal of the heart of a discouraged pastor in a small church. The pastor's name was F.B. Meyer. Later, F.B. Meyer, preaching on an American college campus, led to Christ a student named J. Wilbur Chapman. Chapman began working with the YMCA, and employed a rather crude former baseball player named Billy Sunday. He became inspired to begin evangelistic work, and Billy Sunday went across the country with his evangelistic campaigns. Well, Billy Sunday at one point had a revival, held a revival in Charlotte, North Carolina, and a group of leaders were so enthusiastic afterward that they wanted him to return for another campaign. But Billy Sunday's schedule wouldn't allow it, and so they brought in a relatively unknown man named Mordecai Ham to preach. And in that revival, a young man named Billy Graham heard the gospel and gave his life to Christ. And the story continues right down to us to you and me, and it continues beyond us, out there into the world that Jesus died to save. So Jesus just simply says to us, what does he say? Follow me. Where are you going to follow him this week? And what's that going to look like? Let's stand and sing.
Lord Jesus, thank you for our worship today. Go with us, with us now into this new week. Help us to really take to heart your message and your call to follow you. We look for opportunities this week to do that. We look for ways to be real in our relationship with you, recognize you, and expecting you, accepting your invitations, and looking to your leadership. Lord Jesus, be with us. Fill us again with your Spirit and send us out into this world, the world you died to save. Fill us with your joy, equip us with your peace, and with your hope. We pray it all in your name. Amen. Amen.